Zen's lights glowed briefly, then began to flicker and flash as the circuits inside decoded the seemingly unintelligible series of hisses and beeps they were receiving. Ever since Blake had discovered the Orbiton Relay Station and cut into the Federation Communications System six hours before, Zen had been translating the coded messages and passing them on to Blake. Blake ignored the routine meteorite warnings and the bulletins on magnetic field variations, but he recorded the troop movements that indicated an understrength force on Arxon. He logged the sudden extreme peculiarities of climate on Mang, and he made a welcome note of the armed insurrection on Metabessel. Interesting as this information undoubtedly was, Blake knew it was not enough to bring the Liberator into action. The messages were, by and large, the usual routine exchanges from Federation headquarters to the thousands of outposts in the skies. Blake was beginning to wonder if he could sell the others the idea of travelling all the way to Metabessel to lend a hand, when Zen spoke again, prefacing the message with the type of code used. Hypercode 3, from Ishang to Earth. All reference to the planet Sema to be erased. Planet to be referred to as Ival. Unsuitable for human habitation. All reference to the Sema experiment to be erased. Planet Sema has ceased to exist. Effective immediately. Blake was thoughtful. Hypercode 3 was top priority. Sema was in the Vankan solar system and they had passed within 50 spatials of it two days before. He asked Zen for the rundown on the planet. Zen's lights came to life as the talking computer selected the relevant information from its memory banks. Age, 5,500 million years. Surface area, 214 million acrons. Land sea ratio, 1 to 8. Atmosphere, 1 to 2. Earth normal. Orbital speed, 60,000 AML. Surface temperature, 45.4 B, 69.9 B. Population, 25 million. Anything to suggest they've had some kind of major catastrophe? There was a short pause as Zen checked the orbital variations in the Vankan system. Negative. Blake was still rubbing his chin when Jenna came up beside him. Got anything good? Blake passed her a sheet of thin, shiny material where he had noted down the information. I don't know. What do you think? Jenna studied the Federation message, then glanced quickly over the statistics about SEMA. She placed the sheet down and looked over Blake's shoulder at the screen, which showed a moving map of the solar system in which SEMA maintained its orbit. She pointed to one circular shape moving in a slow circle around a bright light. By the information, I'd say that's it. It's just like Earth. Blake nodded. A little older, bigger and hotter, and a lot less populated. But yes, the similarities are remarkable. This planet here, he pointed to another small circle slightly away from the bright light, would seem to be Ishang. Zen sparkled into life. Correct. Jenna turned away from the screen. And it's still there? Blake gestured back at the screen. Obviously. Then why don't we take a look? Blake smiled. Why not? Zen, set a course for Seema. Shortly afterwards, the Liberator was in orbit around the planet Sema. The blue-green, cloud-covered planet awakened a feeling of homesickness in Blake. Except for the presence of two small moons, he might well have been looking down on Earth itself. Have you checked for viruses, radiation? Affirmative. Planet habitable. No protective clothing required. Is there any sign of life down there? Affirmative. Human. Animal. Vegetable. Blake thought hard. What if the Federation communication system that he had cut into had an anti-tampering device that had warned the Federation? Had they had enough time to set up a trap on Sema, then send out the message? It seemed unlikely. Surely his behaviour wasn't that predictable. Then again, the Federation had complete psychological breakdowns on all of his crew, except Callie. Well, are we going or aren't we? It was Callie speaking. Jenna was whispering to Villa and Avon. Blake went over to the small group. What do you think? Villa and Avon seemed indifferent. Jenna was more positive. It's a chance, she said. If they're prepared to write off a whole planet, it means they must be scared of something. Maybe we can use it to our advantage. Zen broke into Blake's thoughts. 
Federation spaceship assuming orbit around SEMA. Callie looked puzzled. What's it for? I don't know. Maybe it's some kind of guard. Projectile launched Sector 6 on SEMA. Tracking on screen ETA in orbit 12 minutes 2 seconds. Federation spaceship changing course to intercept. Blake acted swiftly. Get us there first then. We want that projectile. Impossible. Federation spaceship will arrive 16 seconds earlier. Then let's get ready to fight. The Liberator came upon the Federation ship as it was taking what seemed to be a small satellite on board. The Federation ship took immediate evasive action. The Liberator opened fire. A small ball of orange light glowed on the ship's stabilizers, then spread swiftly and silently over the whole craft. There was a brief bright flare, then the space ahead was empty except for some small pieces of debris. Let's pick up the satellite. Gan stepped forward. You want me to go out and get it? No need, Gan. Zen says it's made of metal. The Liberator manoeuvred carefully alongside the satellite. The gleaming door to the hold slid slowly back, and two grappling cables snaked outwards and attached their magnetic locks to the satellite. Blake activated the cable return, and the satellite was reeled back into the hold. How is it for contamination and radiation? Satellite safe to handle. Blake took Avon with him and went down into the hold to examine the satellite. Avon listened to the satellite, then unscrewed a partition on the top and peered inside. Crude, but effective, he said quietly, looking at the maze of printed circuits and the tangles of superfine wire. He cut away some of the wires and then reached inside and pulled out a green box. He unscrewed the front and removed a coil of wire from inside. It's a kind of emergency satellite, rather like the flares ancient mariners used to use when in trouble at sea. And that? Blake nodded at the thin coil of brown wire. Avon smiled. This is the message in the bottle. Once we run this through the decoder, we'll know a lot more about the mysterious planet of Sema. Blake and Avon returned to the flight deck and fed the coil into Zen's decoding and translating units. Within seconds, Zen's flat, featureless voice filled the room. Aquatic Research Station calling base. We have received no communiques for six weeks. The situation here is desperate. Supplies are low. The SEMA experiment results are ready. Not certain we can last another night. Send help immediately. Blake looked at his crew. He was surprised to see that the message hadn't discouraged Avon and Villa from their rather passive stand. Zen, did you pinpoint where the rocket was launched? Sector 6, 12 by 18.4. Blake checked the readings on the scanner. The rocket had just launched from the small island just off Seema's largest landmass. He watched a shadow of night creeping slowly across the ocean towards the island. It would be dark on the island in less than an hour, and the man had said he wasn't certain they could last another night. It was Callie who, uncharacteristically, sounded the first note of caution. Are you sure we want to get involved in this? For all we know, the Federation ship may have been coming to the rescue. Or it may have been coming to make sure no distress signals from the planet could be heard by freighters. Jenna seemed convinced. Blake wondered aloud why she was so sure. Avon answered him. Don't bother about why, but we're prepared to go with you on one condition. And that is that after we finish investigating whatever it is going on at this aquatic research station, you beam us down onto another sector of the planet. What for? Blake was unsure. Villa, Avon and Jenna exchanged glances. That's our business. It's a deal. It was dusk when they beamed down into a small concrete enclosure in the middle of a thick, humid jungle. They could hear the sea lapping the shore nearby, but they couldn't see it because of the thickness of the undergrowth. Blake led them towards the open door of the one-storey building in the centre. In the doorway he stopped and drew his weapon. Cautiously he moved inside. He was in a narrow, dimly lit corridor. Lights shone into the corridor from open doors on both sides. He listened. Nothing. He moved down the corridor and entered the first room. Sleeping quarters of some kind. There were three wash basins against the wall, two mirrors and three fold-out bunks. None of the bunks looked slept in. This is primitive, said Avon. I've nearly forgotten why I turned to crime. Villa ran his fingers along the side of the uppermost bunk and looked at them with distaste. He spat on the end of his fingers and rubbed them against his trouser legs. 
Blake moved on to the next room while Callie moved further up the corridor with Gan. Blake looked into a smaller room than the last. It contained one bunk covered with rumpled blankets. The bunk was lying in the middle of the floor and Blake could see where it had been pulled from the wall. Two large filing cabinets stood by the doorway as if someone had pulled them away in a hurry. There were empty food cans scattered over the floor. Blake! Blake ran up the corridor and joined Callie. She was standing in the wreckage of what had once been a laboratory. Callie put her forefinger to her lips. Blake listened. He could hear a squelching sound. He wondered if it was coming from outside the building. A faint movement in the corner of the room caught his eye. He shone a beam in that direction and lit up the grey, shapeless, pulsating back of a living creature. As soon as the beam hit it, the creature reared up and turned round. Jenna cupped her hand to her mouth as she recognised the skeletal white form the creature had been bending over as that of a human being. It's some kind of giant leech! Open up! As the creature moved with surprise and speed towards them, they poured bolt after bolt of deadly radiation into its bloated body. As they backed out of the door, it fell at their feet on its back, wriggling violently, and then curled up into a ball and lay still. They were still staring at it when they heard the scream. <coughs> that came from outside. Let's go. They rushed outside and spread out across the front of the house. Something was coming towards them through the jungle. They took up firing positions and trained their weapons at the area of the jungle the sounds were coming from. The large fronds of a tropical plant were thrown back and a man dashed into the clearing. He fell to his knees, turned his head at the sounds following him in the jungle and then began crawling towards the open door of the building. Hold your fire! Blake had hardly given the order when the undergrowth parted once again and a huge form stopped on the edge of the concrete square. Blake squinted in the darkness. The man on his knees struggled to get to his feet and the creature shot across the square towards him its long, hard, spidery legs scraping and scrabbling along the concrete floor. They opened fire, and in the light of their onslaught, they saw that the creature was a giant crab. Blake shot one of its eyes off its stalk. The crab hesitated for a second while other shots glanced off its rough, spotted shell. It waved its claws aimlessly in front of its face and started forward again, its peculiar, jerky movements belying its speed. The eye! Get the other eye! They opened fire again, aiming for the one remaining eye. A strange, sudden sound like the squeaking of a cork in a bottle told them that they had hit her, but still the crab blundered towards them. Blake picked up the man from the ground and pulled him inside the building. He carried him to the first room that they had entered and laid him on one of the bunks. What's going on? he demanded roughly. The man looked at him with relief. So you've come. I thought the others would have warned you off. I thought they would have put the whole planet in quarantine. What others? What's been happening? Blake watched the hope die in the man's eyes. You're, you're not from the Federation, are you? The window suddenly splintered and a large claw came waving into the room, clicking ominously. Blake picked up a pillow and threw it at the claw. The claw pinched shut and the pillow fell to the floor in two pieces. Blake opened fire but the shot seemed to bounce off the mottled shell. He ducked under the waving claw and started pumping shot after shot into the soft part of the crab's face. The speed with which the crab withdrew its claw from the window almost caught him by surprise. As it was, he was able to avoid serious injury by diving to the floor. When the crab had gone, he resumed questioning. The man's answers were lifeless, dull, resigned. Blake listened impatiently as the story of the SEMA experiment unfolded. It was to have been the Federation's greatest triumph. It was to have made the Vankan solar system the trade centre of the universe. Professor Sang had developed a serum that would mutate living creatures into giants. Just think of it. Limitless food for everyone. Professor Sang? He's somewhere here in the lab. I think the first results were outstandingly successful. All six of us could have lived for months off of one sardine if we had wished. We had prawns the size of horses. What happened? Blake walked to the door and looked down the corridor. The others were still firing away into the night. The serum got out of control. How or why, I don't know. But it wasn't long before the crabs started coming out of the sea. They were hungry, and they weren't alone. We were under siege from leeches and lugworms. 
the North Shore was littered with huge rotting carcasses of what had once been tiny anemones. After Vax was killed by a crab, we drew lots to see who would take the spaceship and escape. Professor Sang and I lost. But why haven't the Federation come back here? Surely this invention is worth persevering with. The man looked down at the floor. No, when the creatures mutated, their organic balance altered. No two pieces of flesh were alike. Those of us who had eaten it suffered terribly. The effects were erratic, but almost always they were harmful. Sang went mad a week ago, and heaven knows what prompted Vax to sabotage the chemical plant where the serum was made. Then how come you're all right? The man rose to his feet. New fires of determination burned in the dark eyes above his sunken cheeks. I hadn't eaten for a month. The effects wear off in that time. He took two halting steps towards the door. Yes, it was to have been a blessing, and now it's a curse. I have cursed this planet to eternal quarantine. I have cursed its inhabitants to countless lifetimes of fear, running and hiding from the huge animals that are even now spreading across the seas. Their whole way of life will be changed. Is that such a bad thing? At least now they'll have to think for themselves, fight for themselves, learn to live without the Federation. The man was walking towards the door at the end of the corridor. The others had stopped firing and were staring into the darkness, listening for the sound of the giant crab stumbling blinded through the undergrowth. Blake held the man's arm and drew the other's attention. There's nothing we can do here. We're beaming up. At that moment there was a noise like an old-fashioned jet engine warming up. The night echoed to some terrible swift battle going on in the undergrowth. A long black shape flicked up against the night above the top of the trees and then vanished. The undergrowth was suddenly flattened as a giant sea snake rolled into the clearing, locked in a battle with the blind crab. The crab had one claw around the sea snake's neck and was trying to dislodge the writhing reptile's teeth from its shell. The snake's tail whiplashed at incredible speed. The man walked towards the battling giants with a gentle smile on his face. The roaring hiss of the snake seemed like music to him. These creatures were his own creations. Callie went forward to drag him back, but Blake stopped her. Let him be. We're going up. On board the Liberator, Blake pulled out some maps of the surface of Seema. He spread them on the table. Now, you three, where would you like to go? If Zen's information is correct, this area here was a favourite with smugglers. He pointed to a small city by an inland lake. That's what you're after, isn't it? Jenna? Something you knew that'd be hidden there? Jenna didn't blush. Blake continued in his bantering tone. One hour should do it. I believe that's what we agreed on. Of course, none of us are obligated to go with you, and that place is just crawling with giant mutations, so I'd advise you to pack a weapon or two along with the sandwiches. What kind would you like, by the way? Crab? Jenna couldn't help laughing, and after the others had been slapping their thighs for a minute or so, even Avon raised a smile. 